then, we're now going to look at, at the dispute resolution process. Now, just from a timing perspective, we're going to be a bit pressed for time, so I'll try to still focus on the main issues. I would like you to still ask questions, but I think that's what makes these sessions valuable. But if there's any questions that are perhaps a bit specific to one client or that's a bit, um, that, that, that won't come up all that often, I'm going to just ask you to, to, to speak to me at the end, then we can talk about that in more detail. Okay, but please keep on asking questions. It's, that's the way it should be. Okay, the new dispute resolution rules. Um, basically, I'm sure most of you would have seen that, and I think Syed has presented quite a few of these sessions where the new re dispute resolution rules came into effect on the 11th of July, 2014. And in short, they apply to all dispute actions going forward. So if there's anything in dispute, you would have to follow the new rules. Obviously, from a, uh, the perspective of responding to SARS, it would be important that where you make reference to the rules, you make sure that you make reference to the new rules, not the old rules. Otherwise, it would perhaps put you jeopardize your, your, your dispute process a bit. Okay, what the process would look like, and I've given, uh, I've drawn up a little diagram to, to illustrate that. The process would basically start, so when you would go into the dispute resolution process would be where you've been aggrieved by an assessment. So in other words, you've got an assessment that you don't agree with. Your, the options that you have there, if the issue is undisputed, so in other words, it's not something where you've got a view and Sasha's got a different view and you need to clear up that dispute. There's two routes of, of resolving that dispute. Firstly, there's the request for correction. So there's a, a mechanism on e-filing where you can, on that specific assessment, you can go and click and, and fix the, the return. So you can basically submit the new return. Um, that button would not always be there. I've got a slide to, to, to just quickly talk through when the button would be there or not. If the button is no longer there, there's also, and perhaps just on request for correction, it could be that you want to, not want to, but that you have to pay more tax, or it could be a reduction in tax. It goes both ways. Section 93 also allows for a reduced assessment. So under certain circumstances, the important part there is it must be an undisputed um, matter, or it must be an undisputed issue you can request a reduced assessment under Section 93 of the Tax Administration Act. If it's a disputed view, so the issue in question is disputed between the taxpayer and SARS, the first step in the process would be for you to, there's an opportunity in the rules for dispute resolution for you to, to request reasons for the assessment. So basically a mechanism to make sure that you understand exactly on what basis has that assessment been issued. Then you can object against the assessment if your objection fails, there's an opportunity to, to go the route of appeal. And in appeal, you, there would be a, an alternative to go to ADR, your alternative dispute resolution, or then your appeal could be for the tax board or the tax court to consider. Okay, now I think the revised rules would give us a good opportunity just to go through some of the important aspects of the rules again. Some of these rules remain exactly as they were before. Some of them there are small changes to, but I think that being aware of the detail of the rules are, it is quite critical for dispute resolution purposes. Okay, if we go to the manner and the form in which you have to submit these things, I'm not going to go through that in detail due to the, the time pressures that we might have. Um, important, just make sure that you use the right form if we look at something like, um, like your objection, you can go onto the SARS website and it shows you there if you are if you're objecting against, let's say, a VAT assessment, then you have to use the ADR or the NOO form. So make sure that you use the right form. There's a very nice table on the SARS website that shows you what form to use. That form must be signed and it must be in writing. And then the delivery date, we've spoken about a bit for, from, the, from, from the taxpayer's side. I think from, the, from Sasha's side, a document would be delivered by you to Sasha only once Sasha has received it. 
So that's when you can say that you have now delivered that document. Okay, the term assessment, I would just like to stand still on that for a while. What does an assessment mean? And the importance of this is that you can object or you can follow the process of dispute resolution against any assessment. An assessment means, um, if we look at the Tax Administration Act definition, it's basically any determination of a taxpayer's tax liability, whether it's done by SASH or whether it's self-assessed. So assessment, the first meaning to this word for dispute resolution purposes is an assessment where you see this is how much tax you have to pay. For the purposes of these dispute resolution rules, an assessment also includes certain decisions. So certain decisions by SASH, these decisions include a decision under section 104. What's important here, that, that, that specific decision refers to the decision not to extend your period for objection. What's important here is that there's a whole list of decisions in each tax act that you can object to. So let's take the, for example, the Income Tax Act. If you go and look at section 3, subsection 4, it gives you a whole list of decisions that if this decision is made by the commissioner and you don't agree with that, you can go and object against that decision. An example of that would be, um, and I'm sure quite a few of the people in smaller practices would deal with this quite often, if you look at your homeowners associations, the, the voluntary homeowners associations, the decision as to whether that homeowners association can be recognized as, as an exempt entity for tax purposes, that's one of the, the decisions listed in section 3, subsection 4. So if, you, if, if that's Sasha's decision and you don't agree with that, then you can also follow the, the dispute resolution rules against that decision. So it's not only an amount of tax that's been assessed, it's an assessment in the normal sense of the word, as well as certain decisions that you can object against. Okay, so very important. Also, if you object against the decision, you may have to make it very clear in your, in your letter of objection what, what is this assessment that you're objecting to. So otherwise, there could be issues going forward as to what exactly did you object to them now. So make it very clear what are you objecting to. Um, the days, we've spoken about the, the definition of days. The definition of days that we find in the Tax Administration Act, it specifically excludes a Saturday, a Sunday, and a public holiday. And then it says for the provisions of Chapter 9, for these purposes, it also excludes the days between 16 December and 15 January. Now, Chapter 9 here is the dispute resolution, the sections dealing with dispute resolution. So for dispute resolution purposes, these, for the purposes of the rules, that the period between 16 December and 15 January, your 30-day periods would, for example, not run. So you'd start the You'd count the days before then and the days after then to see how many days do you have. Okay, then the next aspect I would like to quickly touch on, we're going to go into the more detailed, specific type of extensions that you can, that you can ask for. But in general terms, the rules make provision for you to agree for an extension of the period that you've got to, to follow a certain action in terms of these rules. So by the taxpayer and someone at SARS. What's very important here, and I think that's also a good point of practice for if you want to ask for extension for your, let's say, the period for objection, even though there's specific rules there, that as a general matter, the rule says that if you want to request extension, you have to request the extension before the period expires. So in practice, I've seen that if you do the objection late and you, you put in a section as to why it's late and why it should still be considered, it would often be considered, but as good practice, if you want an extension, it would, be, it would be good practice to ask for that extension before you get to the period where it becomes doubtful whether you can use it or not. Okay, if we look at the undisputed views, the undisputed issues that you, have to, that you might have to resolve, the request for correction button on the two taxes that I think most people deal with most often, on income tax, you would be allowed to to request the correction on your return, but you would not be allowed to request the correction under the following circumstances. The first one, if there's a, an active verification that's in process already, and you've already had one request for correction, and you've submitted 
or well, are there requests for correction that you've already made one set of corrections and there's been an IT14 SD? Well, or between these two, so an active, correct, an active verification and one of these two things, then you can't open up your, your return again to change it. If there's an active audit in progress, you can't do a request for correction. If an estimate has been agreed between Sarge and the taxpayer, you can't go and change on the return that that estimate relates to. If the audit case has been finalized, you can also not go and request a correction there. So in all of these cases, it's not to say that you cannot go and change the, or that you can't go and ask for a, a reduction in your, in your assessment. The important aspect here is just that you can't do it by way of request for correction. So that function would no longer be available. On the VAT, the, you would be able to make adjustments by completing a revised VAT return. The first time that you revise your VAT return, you need not submit any additional documentation. By the second time and third time that you do it, every adjustment that you make, you would have to submit it to further supporting documentation. Then also, in any given tax period, you can't increase your input tax. So let's say you go back half a year. If the adjustment that you would want to make is to increase your input tax, that you can't do in that period six months back. What you'd have to do is you'd have to claim your input tax in the VAT period where you are now. So the VAT legislation says that from the date that, you've, that you became entitled to deduct your input tax, you've got five years going forward that you can claim your input tax. So for input tax, you don't go back to the period when you would have liked to claim it. You, you have to claim it in the period where you are now, if it's still within the five years. And then still, same as for income tax, if you've been audited, you won't be able to do a request for correction, uh, an electronic adjustment to your, to your return. Okay, section 93, the one I spoke about for making um, for reduced assessments. Now, this is one of the instances, there's no, no standard form or no contact person that you'd necessarily have to, or just can go and look on the SARS website to see who to contact. So you would have to send a written request to SARS and probably get someone like Erich to, to give you a contact person to send this to. What's very important here is that this, there's two two instances in which an, a reduced assessment can be issued. The first one is where dispute resolution has been completed and the assessment is reduced. So basically where an additional assessment was raised, you objected to it and that's being, that's being withdrawn, that additional assessment, or the, it's being reversed what was issued. Then the other one is where there was an error as a result of an undisputed error. So there was an error in the assessment and the cause of that error was it's something that's undisputed. So let's take as an example, um, two years later, you as a taxpayer or you as the possibly a new tax practitioner for the taxpayer realized that this taxpayer never claimed allowances on an asset. It's not disputed whether that taxpayer should be allowed to claim these allowances or not. If you can prove that it's undisputed, so your focus of this request would be to show that it's really an undisputed problem then you can submit a request for correction. Also important in this, ach, not a request for correction, a request for a reduced assessment. Also important in this reduced assessment request is that you've still only got the same periods that SARS would be bound by, you are also bound by. So if the period for SARS to issue additional assessments would be three years, the period for you to ask for a reduction in the assessment would also be three years. So those periods would also be binding you in this regard. Okay, if we look at reasons, requesting reasons for an assessment, so what the rules say is that if you are aggrieved by an assessment, then you may require or request us to give you reasons for the, uh, for the assessment. And the whole purpose of requesting reasons is to give you a better view as to why was this assessment issued. So to understand the reasons for the assessment, um, how, do you, how you do this, the documentation that you have to submit in the prescribed form. Now, unfortunately, the problem here is that at the moment there is no prescribed form. So it's once again one of these things that you'd have to send a request to someone at SARS to, to provide you with the reasons for the assessment. 
I think the other issue that one would also have to take into account, you've got 30 days to, to ask for this, these reasons, and then Sasha has got a period of time, um, 30 days, to respond to you. What's important here is that in some cases, practitioners use this as a tactic to delay having to object. So basically, as a, as a tactic to delay the, the eventual outcome that you, that you might have. Uh, what, what you'd have to realize here, here is seeing that you now, at the moment, doing something that would really be a manual action. In a lot of instances where the days would have to start moving over, so as soon as you've requested reasons, your date when you have to object would, would shift forward. The problem with this being a manual action is that the charge system would not always pick up that you've requested reasons. So by requesting reasons, which you are more than you are entitled to do that. You might also just create some administrative difficulties for yourself in having to justify that you're not working with a light, a light objection here. You've actually requested reasons and that's why the date is moved out. So if you are really considering using this as a, me as a mechanism to, to, to delay the process, if one can call it that, just take into account that in delaying that process, you might encounter some unexpected admin issues in having to defend other dates. If you're doing it to really request reasons, then you might still get that same, encounter the same issues, but I think you will hopefully have the, the outcome that you, you will get your reasons if, if Sarge deems it appropriate. Yes. As it stands at the moment, there's no prescribed form that you can use for this, so you would have to submit a letter. I think where it's in future, the, the plan must surely be that it becomes a standard, a standard form that if the form is there, you submit it somewhere on e-filing and you get your, your request. At the moment, it's not there yet. It's a manual, a manual action. Okay, once you've submitted your, your reasons, so within, or your request for reasons, Within 30 days after having, having your, your assessment delivered to you, Sash would have 30 days to notify you of the outcome or then provide you with reasons within 45 days. So Sash can either tell you that you've already, they've given you sufficient reasons for you to be able to object against this assessment or then you've got, you will within 45 days get a detailed, these detailed reasons that you've requested. Um, yeah, once again, I've mentioned that there could be a possible use of this as a tactic to delay. Um, whether it's right or wrong, that's not for me to say, but I think just realize that with this being a manual process, you might complicate your the whole process going forward if you use it unnecessarily. If you use it as it should be, then still know that there might be issues, but at least you will gain something going forward from it. Right, so once you've requested the reasons, then, and you understand exactly how the, what the, how the um, assessment, why it was issued and on what grounds it was issued, then you go to the objection. So within 30 days of the following, so the date of assessment, if you don't ask for reasons, 30 days from that date of assessment, you can ask for or you have to object. If you've, if, you've require, if you've requested reasons, within 30 days of getting a response from Sash saying that you've already had enough reasons, or from getting the reasons, 30 days from that date, you've then got to object. So I think this is where the possible delay in the process comes in. If you follow the route of asking for reasons for the assessment, then your objection period shifts on 30 days after the reasons have been given to you or 30 days after you've notified that, that you've already had enough reasons. Okay, the date